This is what Jesus did. He paid the penalty for sin, satisfying the wrath of God, and he enabled, he enabled the person who believes in him to live above the sin nature. Remember the whole point he's been saying, sin is being personified the sin nature like a master and a ruler and we in our former lives were slaves subject unto this sin. But what? Jesus came, faith came. We were positioned in Christ Jesus. Jesus died to sin, we died to sin. And thus we died to the sin master. All right guys, welcome back to our teaching in the book of Romans. Now, the last time we were here, we were in chapter five and we were dealing with the results of justification. That is, we now have peace with God through our faith, through our belief in what God has provided. And the provision of God is in the sending of his son, the Lord Jesus, the Messiah, to die for our sins and to be resurrected from the dead. And thus, our faith in the works of Christ alone this allows us to be placed into a position where we can be acceptable and justified by God himself to be declared righteous where no sin or penalty of sin can be heralded against us. That is, you see, the whole point of the Apostle Paul, what he was teaching was it was never in accordance to works because if there were any case of works, there would always be the evidence of sin. And as he has been proving since chapters one, two, and three, what? All have sinned, no matter whether they're Jews with the law, Jews under the law, or Gentiles with some form of a principle of a law, or no law at all. The fact remains, all have sinned, and thus with all having been found as sinners, all are now under the judgment and wrath of God. Nevertheless, God desires to save a people for himself. He uses the instrumentality of faith. So thus, sin has to be answered, and sin is answered in the cross of Jesus Christ. That is, Jesus paid the penalty for our sin, and thus he assuaged the wrath of God. That's what we call that. Uh, you see that sometimes in the New, Tes New Testament, propitiation. He became the object of God's wrath in his death so that the wrath, or should I even say it this way, the penalty for our sins, which is the wrath of God, may pass over us because Jesus took them within himself. But anyway, anyway, anyway we don't want to get sidetracked. But the uh, this is God's provision for us. What Christ has done and this and this alone. And thus we are saved by this faith in the work of Jesus alone. And that's the key thing. And you keep hearing me say alone because this is what the text is stressing by faith not by works, not by what you do, not by how you live. So thus, what do we have because of what God has done through Christ Jesus, our believing in this, our faith in the work, person and works of Jesus, chapter five, we have peace with God. And that is one of the main ideas of chapter five, having peace with God and this peace basically, and he kind of even though he starts at early, and I'm not going to re rehearse it because I find myself just about to rehearse it all over again. But what? We have glorification. That is the end result. And when we say glorification of the believer, we're talking about the end results of our salvation. One day we will be with the Lord Jesus Christ, even in the presence of God as glorified people. So that's the final end results. But in the meantime, there is the transformative hand of God in our lives to bring about sanctification. Sanctification simply is a, is a sense of doing away with the sinfulness. That's the idea. But nevertheless, 
God transforms our lives. And so what? Through Christ Jesus, God has done away with the sin of Adam. One sin of disobedience, the taking from the tree of life, resulted in death for all men, the spiritual condition for all humanity. Jesus became the second Adam, and through his obedience, he took upon himself, even namely the cross, all the transgressions so that through him might be given life. And so we see that comparison in chapter five of Jesus to Adam, Jesus being the second Adam, whereas the first Adam brought death into the world. The second Adam brought life into the world. And so thus Jesus came to undo that which Adam had actually done. So in the end result, all that was produced by the singular sin of Adam, resulting in men having sinful natures, resulting in men sinning even greatly, all of these things were undone by the Lord Jesus Christ, the second Adam. For where sin did abound, what? By the works of Jesus by the grace of God, grace did much more abound. And we talked about that in the last video in that word, which means to super abound. Okay. So thus he kind of completes the sense of our justification by faith. That is our having a right standing before God. And as long as you hold to Jesus, the provision of God, let me say this. I don't want to be long, but I must say this. As long as you hold to the provision of God, what has God provided? The second person of the divine Trinity, Jesus, God in sending his son. This is a voluntary action of Jesus as well. Coming into this world to live a righteous life. Thus, his righteousness is counted to our account, is placed on our account, but he received a sinner's death. And thus, Jesus became our substitute and the wrath of God was exhausted upon him. And God shows approval of this in the resurrection of his son from the dead, giving him new life. And we're going to talk about that even more in chapter six. So thus, this is the provision of God. And, and by this, what God has provided is a means or way unto salvation. And if you believe, if you receive this gift of God by faith, then you are in a right standing with God. And that's the key. So the reason why I really wanted to bring that out is because in knowing these things, you may settle in your heart and in your mind. I have no doubt at the time of my death or the rapture, whichever one comes first, I will be with the Lord. Why? My hope is in Jesus and Jesus alone, who he is. God made flesh. What he did, righteous living, he did no sin, neither was any form of deceit found in his mouth, but nevertheless, he was crucified. He died for my sins and God raised him from the dead. This is the gospel of faith. This is the content of what we must believe in order to, to be saved. And if you do believe these things, you are justified. Romans 5 again, you have peace with God because you have accepted the provision of God's plan of salvation. Okay, so that's how we're going to end that. Now let's get into chapter 6 and hopefully I think we should be able to do, it kind of seems a little lengthy and it seems a little bit difficult, but in reality, it's not that difficult at all because he is continuing a logical strain, a, a string of arguments. In other words, he was saying what? Jesus, the second Adam, that's the end of chapter five, came so that 
all of the sins that were committed because of the first Adam, that is the first Adam brought sin into the world transgression because of his sin and sin just abounded. The second Adam, Jesus Christ, he brings grace into the world by the operation of God so that grace will always outdo super abound sin. So whereas sin abounded, that's the whole end of that. Grace did what? Much more abound. So now he continues in the logical argument. Now, in a, in a twisted way, as he opens up chapter six, in a somewhat twisted way, the reason why I say twisted way is because of this. The perversion, because we, we have seen already where some have uh, falsely accused Paul of encouraging people to sin. This is what he's, this is the matter that he's about to deal with now. Um, so he deals with that perverse idea. So since grace is super abounding in the presence of sin, shall we continue to sin? We who are believers in Christ Jesus, shall the saints of God continue to sin? Does sin have importance in the life of the believer? What is the effect of sin in the life of the believer? What is the, pos the position of the believer to sin? So all of these questions he is going to deal with in this particular chapter. But the essence of what he's dealing with is what is uh, the position of the believers, the perspective of the believer, one who believes in Christ Jesus towards sin shall we continue to sin or sometimes we hear we say it this way are we free to sin if we believe in jesus in other words you may hear a person say and i know this is kind of long but let me just kind of stretch it out so you'll understand it really good since we are not saved by what we do and that is an absolute fact that's what paul has been proving from the beginning of chapter one. Why? When you deal with us, always sin, always sin. But since we are not saved by what we do and we are saved by what God has done, that is faith in Jesus. What is that magical word? Alone. Faith in Jesus alone. Does it leave us free? to continue to live in sin? Does it leave us free to live like we want to? Why? I'm not saved by what I do. So what? I can continue to live just like I'm living. That is in sin because what? My life did my, my works did not save me in the first place. So therefore, am I free to keep going like I'm going? Why? I believe in Jesus. And you'll see that same instance of thought answered by James when James deals with that principal theme when he says faith a belief in Christ Jesus without works living righteously is meaningless is dead so that's the instance of what Paul is going to deal with now the believers relationship to sin now that he has faith in Christ Jesus okay too long let's get started what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who die to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism in death so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. Let me continue. I know it's kind of long, but it's not difficult. But for if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, what? Certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is free from sin. Okay, like I said, now this seems kind of lengthy, but actually it is really easy. So what did he say? 
So he is continuing that logical string of argument about where sin abounded. That's the end of chapter five. Grace did what? Super abound. So that's thus shall we now participate. That's what that's what he's beginning to say in verse number one. Shall we participate in such a way that grace may super abound? And what will be our participation to continue sinning? So shall we say, in other words, we want grace to do what really grow. And shall we do it in order for grace to super abound? It has to be abound in the presence of sin. So shall we now sin so that grace can, can, can do what? Keep on abounding and even super abound so that grace may ever increase. He says that is ridiculous. Verse number two, may it never be. Notice how shall he who died to sin still live in it? Now, there are a couple of things that I want to say, uh, uh, First of all, about sin. So let me just introduce them one at a time. In the Greek text, and I, I always put the Greek text alongside of it, and I might even highlight that so that you can see it. In this particular chapter, in almost every instance, almost every instance where there is a mention of sin, the definite article is present. When I say the definite article, it means the, we just call it the. OK, in whatever form you might find it, the definite article is present in almost every case until we get, I think, somewhere around verse number 14 or whatever. Uh, but the point is, uh, he says the sin. Now, when you look at it in our English translation, it just simply says sin, kind of like to deal with the nature of sin, the essence of sin or principle of sin. But actually in the text, he says the sin. And it is almost like in a sense of a personification of sin or an object sin in a sense of objectivity uh, 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 or the sense or even say it this way. The sin nature, you'll see that a lot. You'll see that a lot. So as we move through the text, I I'll talk about it, but. The sin, so sin explicitly, not just sin principally, but sin explicitly, even the sin nature of us. And, I'm, and I might as well say this, and that's why you'll see sin in relationship to the body. Why? Because as it has to do with us, sin is in our physical bodies. And that's what I want you to understand. That's also important too, according to scripture. Sin is not just something that is in and of the mind. Sin is of the flesh itself, our body. And even as we work through these particular texts, this here, we will see Paul talking about sin in the body and its relationship to the body that whereas Adam and, and I don't want to. OK, I really don't want to get into this in a sideways, but as Adam sin, notice now, notice there is the commandment of God. Genesis 2 and 15, I believe it is every tree you can eat except the tree of knowledge of good and evil day you do you will die. The death of Adam was holistic. He not only died spiritually, but what you find out later on and at what, after what, 930 years, I think Adam was something of that nature. Adam died. Death became physical. So thus the very nature of sin is engrafted in the flesh. Sin is in the body for sin brings about death. It brings about death spiritually, separation from God. It brings about death. That is, you lose your physical life and this inherited by Adam. But anyway, enough of that. So I just simply said, that's why that definite article is there. So for the most part, if you want to deal with it in general, understand sin in the sense of the sin nature or the sin principle, the sin nature or the sin principle. So that's number one. And then, okay, he says this, uh, uh, 
going back, let, let's go back to the text because that was an aside I needed to make. He talked about, shall we continue in sin? Okay. All right. Then he said, never may go, may go nor tie. May it never be, or God forbid, how shall we who died to sin live in it? Now, this is the second thing I want to talk about. Positional truth, positional truth. Now, what is a positional truth? A positional truth, and, and, and you will see it oftentimes talked about some particular statement uh, about the believer with reference to being in Christ. So a positional truth is the state of the believer because the believer is in Christ. It is how God looks at the believer. When I notice when I say believer, one who believes in Christ Jesus, that is, I believe that Jesus, the son of God came in the flesh, died for my sins, all of that good stuff. Okay. How does God look at you? What is your position because of your faith? And this is what I mean by positional truths. And so you will see a number of positional truths even here. And this is the introduction of the very first one. Notice, how shall we who died to sin? Now, how did we die in sin? Paul is going to develop that thought, that positional truth in the furtherance of his point. As Jesus himself died for sin, we by faith, we by believing in Jesus, in his person and in his works, what works in particular dying for sin. So there is an association and we're going to see that particular term used here, too. There is a particular association, positional truth, that the believer has with Jesus. So as Jesus has died to sin, we participate alongside of Jesus. Jesus died to sin. Therefore, what? We are dead to sin. And why are we dead to sin? Are we now think about what I'm about to say? Are we dead to sin because we do not sin? No, that's not true at all. For what? He's going to later on say, for all have sin. And, and, and I don't, I'm not going to get into it right now, but he's going to say, and fall short of the glory of God. That verse is a present tense. And even in chapter seven, he's going to talk about the struggles that we still have with sin, chapter seven and chapter eight. So the point is, even though we are in Christ Jesus, Jesus died for sin because of our faith in him, our position in him. God looks at us as dead to sin. God looks at us as having no sin. Why? Because we are in Christ. This is a positional truth. Jesus OK, let me continue it on. This may end up going longer than necessary, but you'll get a good grasp on it. Jesus has no sin. He never sinned. He never spoke a deceitful word and we are in him. So thus, how does God look at us without sin? We are without sin. Why? Because we are in Christ Jesus. So this is the same sense of being what? Dead to sin. Jesus died on that cross that so that he may do away with our sins. And thus, because we have faith in him, are in him we are dead to sin. These, this statement and such, such others as we'll see are positional truths. Now, what Paul is going to do in the text, and I, I know I'm a little premature, but I'm saying it so that it'll give you really good clarity when we get to it. This is our position in Christ Jesus. This is who, this is who and what we are. All right. This, in, in, a, in a legalistic standing, OK, in a legal or forensic standing. This is how the believer stands before God because of faith in Jesus. However, it becomes necessary 
to now live it out. Now, do you understand that God has given us this legal position? This is who you are justified in good shape with God. Why? Because of your faith in Christ Jesus. Now the believer needs to respond to that. How do you respond to that? By conforming, by doing those things that are pleasing to God. So in accordance to the positional truth of us being dead to sin, we now need to live it out. That is, try to live our very best without sin. Live in accordance to our position in Christ Jesus. I think you guys got that part. So now let me just simply go back to the text and we'll just work it all out in accordance to how God has given it to us. So thus we cannot live in sin. Verse number two, because we are dead to sin. And then he speaks of how this positional truth has been accomplished. We who have been buried with him through baptism in death. Notice there is the association of baptism in death. As we are in Christ Jesus, baptized by the spirit into the body of Christ Jesus, into Christ Jesus, we are also baptized into the works of Jesus. What particular works? The work of death, death for sin. So that what? Notice this was purposeful so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the father, we too might walk in newness of life. So as Jesus died to sin and he said, what? And likewise, we need to consider ourselves what dead to sin. If we're dead to sin, we're not living in sin. We're not practicing sin because we are in Christ Jesus and being found that way positional truth, dead to sin, baptism into the death of Jesus Christ. Jesus did not remain dead. He was resurrected to a newness of life. And thus we too ought to be what? Resurrected to a newness of life. The newness of life in being dead to sin, but now alive to righteousness. This is the newness of life that we now have. So thus, this is how we reckon ourselves. The positional truth is dead to sin, but we need to work it out. And it kind of takes my mind back to what the apostle Paul said in the book of Philippians. Remember what he said? Work out your salvation. See, it almost sounds like a system of justification by works, but that's not what he meant at all. Responding to who you are in Christ Jesus, responding to what Christ Jesus has done for you, work out your salvation, live in a way that is pleasing to God with fear and trembling. Why? Knowing what? Whatever you are doing in this working out, in this sanctification with regards to your uh, increasing personal holiness in this life, knowing that it is God who is at work in you to do his will, to fulfill his purposes. So, no, okay, 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 okay. No more sidetracking. The point that Paul is trying to make, what? Again. Our position is in Christ, dead to sin, so that, in that same continuation thought of position in Christ, newness in life Jesus. We are now raised as new people with new lives. No longer old lives of sin, but new lives of holiness. So he says, so for if we become united with him in likeness of death, we shall be united with him also in resurrection. What? The point that I just made, new lives of holiness, our old self, verse number six, old self, old man was what? Crucified with Christ. Again, notice those positional statements in, in Christ Jesus, because of our faith in Jesus, there is an association with Jesus. Jesus was crucified. What? So were we crucified. But it's talking about the crucifixion of the old man. 
the old man of sin. What? In order that our body, notice, remember that what I just told you guys, how sin is always related to the body, how that our body of sin might be done away with so that we will no longer be slaves to sin. In other words, we participated in the cross of Jesus, in the crucifixion of Jesus, so that this sin that is in our body may be done away with so that we will no longer be a slave to the sin nature. So what Jesus did on the cross here in verses number six, for he who has died is freed from sin. Now that's verse number seven. I'm going to get to that. But what Jesus has done is Jesus has given us the ability to live above the sin nature. You see, Inside of us, all of us, there is no exception. Every person on this planet, and that's what we talked about in chapter uh, five, right? Every person on this planet has a sin nature and this inherited because of Adam. So we all have that. There is always that evil that arises from the flesh, from the body itself. All right. And before Christ, there was really no help. But what Jesus did in his dying for sin and to sin, Jesus enabled us to be free from the master of our sin nature. And notice I use that terminology, the master, because as we move on down later in the text, Paul is going to term our sin nature in the sense of a master or a king, someone who rules and dominates over you. But what Jesus did, he gave us the ability to overcome the sin nature. We don't have to be subject to the sin nature. The sin nature may say lust, and it does for everybody. And doggone it, I mean everybody. The sin nature may say to do these things, but... By the grace of God, by our position in Christ Jesus, the gift of God, by the enablement of what Jesus has done, we can say no. We can say no. And again, there is always that little reference to, to uh, Paul's teaching in the next chapter seven, where Paul talks about this body of death, that sin nature that dwells in the flesh. Paul will say, who will deliver me from this body, this body of death, this sin nature that wants to rule and reign. When I seek to do good, what is always there? Always evil is always present. Help me. And he says what? I have received that help. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus conquered sin and therefore sin is no longer our master. We are dead to sin. And notice for he who has died, that's verse number seven, is what? Freed from sin. Sin can no longer be our master if we are dead. That is, think of it this way. There is a master who commands a slave. We are, uh, sorry, we were that slave. And the master was sin. Sin was once commanding us. But what happened? As Christ Jesus died, we, the slave, also died. And thus, since the slave is dead, the master can no longer command him. Sin cannot command the dead slave. We are, we were, and it kind of says are, but we are slaves differently, as Paul is going to talk about even in this chapter, slaves to God. We have a new master now. You got it? We died to the old master. So thus we are free, free from the power of sin. Okay? We are not free from the temptation Temptations will always remain, but we are free from the inability to resist sin and participate in sin. Thus, whenever we sin, it's never, I couldn't help it. 
It's never, well, I just didn't have no, it just took the better of me. No, you gave in to sin and allowed sin to be hopefully temporarily your master again. Because what? Positionally, that's the point. You are in Christ. And what did Christ do to sin? He died to sin. And because we are in Christ, we died to sin so that sin would not rule over us. So then if we do sin, it's because we gave in to it. It's not because we had we got the I can't help it or I've heard some people say the devil made me do it. <laughs> no, 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 no. The sin nature we yield it to. OK, but the point that Paul is trying to bring here and I'm going to bring this part to a close is Jesus has Jesus is the solution. And us being in him dead to sin, we no longer are subject to sin. Eight. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. The, the, the idea is still the same. He's talking about sin and the believer's perspective or relationship to sin and the death, dying to sin, living, living again, newness of life, righteousness, a new way of life. OK, so that same idea he is carrying on. So let me go back to the scripture. We have died with Christ. We believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that what? Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Notice that never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. You see that the parallel death is no longer master over him for the death that he died. He died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Eleven. Let me keep going. Even so, that's the important point right there. Even so, hutas kai is what it says in the Greek. Even so in this manner, what? Just like whatever he was saying, I'm going to get back to that. Consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. OK, and I'm going to stop there. I don't want to go on too long. So he is continuing this idea of the, this positional truth. Jesus died on that cross to sin for sin. We are in Christ Jesus. Thus, being found in Christ Jesus, consider ourselves what likewise did to sin. So what? But let me go back to the verse again. Verse number eight. Let me start it again. So what if we have died with Christ and the idea, not so much as if we have died with respect to the believers since we have died. That's the idea. OK, we also believe we will live. So, again, he's bringing in positional truths. Jesus died, died for sin. Jesus didn't remain dead. He was resurrected from the dead to new life. And we positional truth have new life because of Christ Jesus. What? That Christ being raised from the dead is never to die again. Notice the, the effectiveness and the permanence of the work of Jesus. What do you mean? The effectiveness when Jesus went to that cross, he dealt with all sin, every sin for all time. And thus its effect was total and permanent with no need of Jesus having to die anymore. When he died once, he died for sin for all time. And thus, now notice this point, death is no longer to master over him. Jesus would no longer be subject to death. Once Jesus died and he rose again, when he rose again, he rose to immortality. That body, he rose to what immortality? His body was never to be subject to death again. The same parallel is continuing here about sin. What? 
We are in Christ Jesus. And as Jesus died to and for sin, so did we. And as death is no longer a master over Jesus, Jesus is no longer subject to death. Guess what? Death, principle of sin itself, sin is no longer master over us. You got it? So therefore what? Because we, positional truth, are in Christ Jesus, Jesus dying for sin, no longer being subject unto what? Because he's going to death. That's the whole beauty of it. That's the whole beauty of it. At the very end of the chapter, the wages of sin is death. Jesus no longer subject to death. He's no longer subject to what? Any consequence of sin. And I'm not speaking about the consequence of Jesus's sin, but Jesus paying the price for all sin. Okay. No longer subject to any consequence of sin. Death is no longer his master. He's no longer subject to it. And thus we being in Christ. What? We are no longer subject to sin either. Death can no longer be our master. But anyway, for the death that he died, verse number 10, he died for sin once for all. It's one time thing. Life that he lives, he lives unto God. And that's why he says, even so, in verse number 11, that is the parallel. In the same sense, consider what? Just like Jesus died unto sin once and is no longer subject to death, you consider yourself to be dead to sin and alive to God. So thus, we too have died to sin. And like Jesus was resurrected from the dead to newness of life, we consider ourselves to now be alive, dead to sin, but alive to God. So thus, if we are alive to God, we ought to do what? Be living righteously. Our God is a just holy and righteous God. So we are to live to unto God. That's why he sums verse number 12 is a summation. What does he say? I like that too, because the word means like to reign as a king. And that's the point that I was trying to talk about. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lust. Okay, this is a beautiful statement. So now what? We have been empowered. We are now enabled. Sin was once our master. That's why do not let sin reign, reign like a king. Notice that he talked about it earlier. What? Like we were once slaves and sin was the slave master telling us to do its bidding. And so now he is saying what? Dethrone sin, dethrone sin from its reigning and majesty in your life. Do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey his lust. Enabled by Christ Jesus, being in Christ Jesus, you do not have to sin. You are dead to sin. And therefore, because of the grace of God, the gift of God, he commands you, do not let it rain. This is an imperative verb. Do not let sin, notice like sitting on a throne telling you what to do. Do not let sin command you anymore. But notice, reign in your mortal bodies. Remember the point that I was trying to make? Where is the sin principle? It is always in our bodies. That thing that rises up, that temptation, those evil thoughts, sometimes they are without, but oftentimes they are within. And always remember, you would not sin if it didn't touch something within. But anyway, what? <laughs> Don't let sin reign in your mortal body so that you may obey its lust. So now he begins to answer or even respond to the question that he first bring up. Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? Shall we, the believer, continue to sin? 
do we, the believer, have the, uh, are we subject to sin? Do we have to sin? His answer is, do not sin. We are not subject to sin. We are overcomers because of Jesus, because of us being what? In Christ Jesus, Jesus died to sin. We participated along with Jesus. We are dead to sin. So therefore, verse number 12, do not sin. Even though what? Now let's go back and look at, at the point that he's trying to deal with. Even though, go all the way back, chapters 1, 2, and 3. What? We are not saved by what we do. That's the whole point of it all. Coming up to verse number 4, chapter 4 justification by faith, even Abraham becoming that example, right? We are put in a right standing with, with God the Father. This is that forensic term, a legal term. God looks at us and he says what? I find no fault at all. I see no sin. And when I say God's, because no sin, always remember this. No sin can stand in the presence of God at all. God does not deal with that. God is holy in the absolute sense. What did he say in the book of Isaiah? Holy, holy, holy. Okay. So when God sees us, absolutely no sin. It does not matter. Why? Because God is not necessarily looking at us in a naked sense, in an alone sense. God is looking at us in Christ Jesus. So imagine Jesus standing before God, Jesus standing before God, and also imagine us being clothed in Jesus. We are inside of Jesus. And so thus, as God is looking at us, who is he looking at? He's looking at his son. And what will God say about his son? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus did no sin in him. There was no fault found. So that's the positional truth. Us being in him. You got that? And thus what? This was God's provision for us so that God would declare us to be righteous apart from anything that we do. Faith in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. I believe in all who he is and what he has done. And thus God says, and you are absolutely righteous. You are without sin. And then all of a sudden people begin to say, wow. So it's just a system of just faith because that's the whole point. What Paul was dealing with in chapter three. What? It has always been the principle of faith whereby God would declare a person righteous. And Abraham did what? Believed God and God counted his what? Faith to be righteous. It has always been by faith and never in accordance to works what a person has done. And then the person says, you say, what? So I can have this righteous standing before God simply because I believe in Jesus and, and what? I guess it matters not how I live. That's the purpose of chapter six. No, no. You are now what? Dead to sin. Remember, you are in Christ Jesus. Jesus died and he rose. He died to sin. You in him died to sin. And this gave you the ability not to be subject to to the rule of sin. Sin should not master Lord over you. He enabled you to live a new life. Jesus rose from the dead to newness of life and you have a newness of life. That newness of life is unto whom? Unto God. So thus the life will be a life of righteousness. So he just simply says in 12, what? Thus, even though we are justified by our faith alone, that does not give us permission to live in sin. On the other hand, yea, rather, it tells us whatever you do, do not sin. Why? Because you have been repositioned. You are repositioned 
in Christ Jesus. And having been found in Christ Jesus, how should you present yourself? And that's the end of verse number 13. Do not go on presenting the members of your body as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as alive from the dead, alive from your old nature, alive from sin. I used to sin. I used to live any kind of way, but I believe in Jesus. I died with Jesus. I died to sin. And now Jesus rose and thus I am alive with him too. And now I present myself no longer to sin to be my master. I present myself to God to be my master. And I present my members, that is, live out your life, how you live a life, living a sanctified life, living a righteous life, right? As instruments of righteousness unto God. All right. 14. Why? And notice that same idea is continuing. Notice as he talks about sin. Now here in verse number 14, he does not use the definite article for sin, but he, 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 he leaves it off because he is now talking about a principle of sin. So sin is neither being personified in any way and sin is not being talked about in the sense of sin nature, but a principle of sin, any kind of principle of sin. What? 14. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. So let me just deal with that. So what? There is no form no principal form of any sin that is your master. Why? Jesus defeated these things. And he's going to talk about something else too. As in this defeated, because notice the sense of what? Master and slave. Master and slave. Sin is not your master. Jesus defeated sin as your master. He did that on the cross. And Jesus set you free from that master. You see it now? So sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under any principle of law. Then note, this is not the law of Moses, but that's why I say any principle of law. In other words, the system whereby we are in a right standing with God is not based upon our obedience to anything. We are under what? Grace. Grace is the system of God's provision. That's what grace means. What God has granted. What has God granted? God has granted life, righteousness, or in other words, all of these things are simply words that are similar to salvation. God has granted salvation. What is that grace that God has granted? Salvation he has granted? Faith in Christ Jesus. For you are not under any form of a system of law. You do this, you do that, you do this, you do that. Then you are saved. No, you are under a system of grace. Believe in him. Believe in what Christ Jesus has done. Receive the gift of God. Notice that's the whole point of everything he's been talking about in chapters three, four and five. But anyway, so what? Sin is not your master. We are under a principle of grace, a system of faith, system of faith, not any system of performance. Right. What then? Since and note it, he keeps developing that thing. Since, see, you saved by what? What is it? Not by a law, not by you did this, you did that. Are you still thinking that you're free to do this and do that? <laughs> that is to sin, because notice the whole theme of everything is I've been talking about what being subject to sin, committing sin, being dead to sin. So he, he, he goes back to it again from another angle. This is what we're doing now from another angle. What yeah, we free to sin now because what we I'm saved by that principle of, of what grace of faith. Am I now free to do what I want to do? Am I free to lie? Am I free to commit adultery and fornication and all in whatever sin. Am I free? That's what he's talking about. What then? 
Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? May it never be. Shall we sin? Why? Because I ain't saved by what I do anyway. So what I do cannot save me. What I do has never saved me and it has never saved anybody. Hot dog. Since I ain't saved by what I do, what I do doesn't matter. That's what he's driving at. Shall we now uh, uh, sin because we are not under any kind of a law, but now we're under grace? I just got to believe in Jesus. If I believe in Jesus alone, then I'm saved. And since I believe in Jesus, and I'm going to say I believe in Jesus. And since I do believe in Jesus, guess what? I can do. I'm free. That's the idea that's beginning to permeate. I'm free to live like I want. That is obey the body of sin, sin, obey sin in this body. He says, what may it never be? God forbid. Just because we have not been saved by what we do does not mean once we believe in Jesus, we are free to live like we want. His whole point, his argument is dead to sin. Jesus has paid that price set you free and enabled you to live. And thus, as Jesus rose from the dead to a new life, you are to rise to a new life, getting rid of your old man, your old life. And you are to now respond to God with a new life of righteousness. No, no grace does not allow you to live in sin. That's the answer. So he just continues on to give examples. Verse 16. Do you not know that when you present yourself to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which results in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And notice the language. Having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. For I am speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting even in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Now, again, these are lengthy statements, but it's really easy. So what he is saying, he says, because noted, let's, keep, let's go back to the point. I'm never saying by what I did in the first place under any principle of law. That's what he means by that. But by grace, saved by faith, believing in Jesus, does that leave me free to live like I want to live? That is to live in sin. So he begins to say in verse number 16, he says, wake up, use common sense. Don't you know that if you live unto sin, if you live in sin, you are the slave of sin. When you present yourself to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey. You are a slave to sin when you live in sin and sin results in death. But if you present yourself being raised with Jesus Christ to newness of life, you would also what in presenting your members that newness of life. I am going to live differently now, not going to live in sin anymore, but I believe in Christ Jesus. I'm a new person. Now I'm going to live in a manner that pleases to God, that pleases God. And that's why he says obedience, obedience to God resulting in righteousness. And thus he says what? And now he gives thanks to God. Thanks be to God that what? When the preaching of the gospel came, when the teaching of the gospel came, you obeyed. You obeyed what? Casting away your former lives of sin and adopting the new life that you have in Christ Jesus, righteousness unto God. Right? 
you obeyed from the heart that form of teaching that you were committed and being freed from sin. Now notice, they were freed from sin. This is what Jesus did. He paid the penalty for sin, satisfying the wrath of God, and he enabled, he enabled the person who believes in him to live above the sin nature. Remember the whole point he's been saying, sin is being personified, the sin nature, like a master and a ruler. And we in our former lives were slaves subject unto this sin. But what? Jesus came, faith came. We were positioned in Christ Jesus. Jesus died to sin. We died to sin. And thus we died to the sin master. Jesus rose from the dead to new life. And thus now we have new life, right? And that new life, all these things have been given to us by Jesus. This enablement to live lives of righteousness is by Jesus. It kind of takes you back to what Jesus says. I'm the vine and you are the branches. And except you abide in me, you can do nothing. For without me, you can do nothing. It takes your mind back to this principle teaching of Jesus. These things, that is, to live lives of righteousness, this enablement was done by Jesus. And I said all of that to deal with this instance of when it says, you have been set free from sin, having been freed from sin. Power of sin, the results of sin, and enabled to live above sin, enabled to live righteous lives. So you became what? Slaves of righteousness. You, we are still slaves. We just simply have a different master. In our former lives of sin, sin was our master, even Satan. But now, because of our faith in Christ Jesus, God is our master because of what Jesus has done, set us free. And also, again, that sense of what? Enablement. For when you were the slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteous. When we were slaves of sin, we were doing what everything else. We weren't living righteous lives. We weren't doing things that were pleasing to God. Why? Sin was our master. 21, let's bring it to a close. Therefore, what? Benefit were you then deriving from the things which you were now ashamed for the outcome of those things is death. But now having been freed from sin, notice again, freed from sin by whom Jesus Christ, by what he has done and his enablement and enslaved to God, you what you derive your benefit resulting in sanctification and even the outcome, eternal life and principal statement. Why? For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. So he says what? Okay. Now we have been set free from the power of sin and enabled by Christ Jesus, the cross of Jesus, the life resurrection of Jesus, enabled to live lives of righteousness unto God. He looks back and he wants us to look back. He said, now look back on how you used to live. He said, what benefit was all of those things? When you, when we lived in sin, things that we were once, we are now ashamed of. And, and I don't even want to go through any kind of list or any litany of sins that we committed. There were things that we did in the darkness. There were things that we have done that we hope nobody ever finds out about. But the point is, it brought about shame, but not only did it bring about shame, but these things, sins, resulted in death. For the outcome of it is death. But what? Thanks be to God. Glory to God. Through Christ Jesus, we have been freed from the 
uh, sanctions because of sin, the, the, the death, the power of sin. We have been enabled to live above sin, freed from sin, and we are now what? Slaves unto God. And now what is that benefit? resulting in sanctification. And this word basically is a root for holiness. So our, again, positional truth, positional truth, our position that we have now before God in Christ Jesus is when God looks at us, he sees holiness, sanctification. And what is the result now? What is the benefit what is the working out? What Jesus has done for us? Eternal life. So we have two positions. Our former position with respect to our master, sin, death. Our new position with respect to our new master, God, because of what Jesus has done, eternal life. And therefore, he gives the principal statement that we are all familiar with in verse number 23 for the wages of sin. And again, that definite article, I like that for the wages of this master for the how does sin pay? The sin is the master. And what is his payment to the slave? Death. The wages of sin is death. But what? Now let's look at our new master, who is God, that truth that we have, but the gift of God. Now notice that free gift of God, not something that we do, not something that we work for, but something that God has provided. Jesus sending his son, dying on the cross, resurrecting from the dead. And all we have to do is believe the gift of God is eternal life. So there are two masters in the end. One is the master of sin, even the sin nature. And how does he pay those who obey him with death? And then the other is master God being raised with Jesus Christ to newness of life to serve a new master. And what does God grant? Notice the gift of God. God doesn't pay us anything because we haven't earned it. It is a gracious gift. Why? All we had to do was believe we did nothing. But yet God granted us this wonderful gift. And how did God give this gift unto us? Or should I say, what was the expression of God's gift to us? It was life. Okay. That was a little long, but I enjoyed it again. Now let's summarize the chapter. What was Paul's point? His whole issue, and I'm quite sure you guys got it. What is the believer's position to sin, relationship to sin? In other words, grace has come and now we have life because of faith in Jesus alone. Does that allow us to continue in sin? And second part of it, does that give us freedom to commit sin like we did in our former lives? And in both cases, he said, God forbid. Why? We are in Christ Jesus. Those positional statements. Jesus died to sin. And thus we in association with Jesus in his death, we too died to sin. So thus sin, the, the power of sin, the bonds that sin had over us, sin being our master, this is broken by the death of Jesus Christ. And Jesus also rose from the dead where death no longer will be. He's no longer subject to death. And thus we too are to rise to a newness of life where death, the principle of sin, shall no longer be subject. We shall no longer be subject to sin. So thus his whole point. Do not continue. That's verse number 12. 
to go on sinning. So what is the perspective of the believer? Even though we are saved by faith, believing in Jesus alone and not because of what we do, it does not leave us free to continue to sin. But rather, we are, we are to live transformed lives before God. Being in Christ and, as I was saying to you guys earlier, working it out, living it out. That which God has positioned us, now live it. How did Paul say now live it? Do not continue to present the members of your body to sin. Don't do that. But do what? Present the members of your body to live righteously before God. Live it out. Live out the truth that God has given. You are in Christ, holy before God. Live this out. By what? Not sinning. Okay? All right, guys. Thank you for joining me with that and being ever so patient. If you have enjoyed this particular teaching, of course, do the YouTube thing, hit that like button. And also, if you have not subscribed, now would be a good chance to subscribe to the channel so you won't miss any of these teachings. And if the if you have noticed in YouTube, there's always these annoying ad interruptions. So subscribe to my Patreon. And in doing that, you will also be able to watch this whole video and all of the videos without any ad interruptions from YouTube and support the ministry. Whether you support the ministry with Patreon or even with a one-time donation, do so if the ministry has been a blessing to you. And for those who have supported me, thank you for all that you do. The Lord knows what you do and the Lord will return the blessing. But anyway, thank you guys for joining with this Continue to join me as we get into chapter seven, as Paul continues to talk about that once power of sin, but the once, the now freedom that he has in Christ Jesus, freedom from the bounds of sin. All right. See you next time.